morning, everyone, and welcome to the first of our weekly re uh, weekly reading videos. Now, the reason I'm doing these weekly videos is I wanted to take a moment. Sorry, everyone, for those who can hear that my dog is asleep on the floor and clearly having a very exciting dream, probably about the cats. Um, the one of the reasons I wanted to make these videos is I wanted to give you a kind of an insight into why I chose these readings, um, and sometimes you know what the readings are, are really going into because. This isn't an arbitrary list, you know, you know, I don't I don't pick readings to fill time. Each of these readings has a a sentimental or, or a theoretical or even a philosophical connection to the way in which I perceive forensic psychology as a whole, but also kind of the specific area that we're going to be talking about. And a lot of these readings are by friends, colleagues, but but sometimes they're just the the reading that stands out. You know, I've read thousands of, of, of papers. Um, in the area, that, that's not a brag. That's, that's more of a comment on how much of a, how much time I wasted reading as a child. Um, but 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 some of them just stick with you and they stay with you and you remember them um, kind of going forward. And, and most often, those are the ones that end up kind of coming through to this syllabus because there is no ideal course for forensic psychology. Sorry, there is no ideal textbook for forensic psychology. And, and I, I bring to it a, a certain perception. And, and my hope is that by kind of talking to you about these readings, you'll, you'll share that perception with me. Now, the reason I chose this one, um, Brent Snook's paper, and, and it seems like an interesting one, I think, to, to start with, because it it is relatively negative, if we're being honest. I mean, the title, What's Behind the Smoke and Mirrors, I mean, that Along with the, along with the other one that I'll probably cite, which is the kind of Grand Falloon and Gobbledygook paper, um, you know, it, it's this, it, it, it's an interesting piece that that questions the role of forensic psychology, and I think it's important that you read that. You know, that we we go through this idea of you know, is the forensic psychologist all they're cracked up to be? Um, but but the reason I chose this paper is is also because there's a there's a habit in psychology, and I, and I'd call it if anything the habit of the naysayer. And it's this this idea that someone can create a career by naysaying the actions of others, and and that's fine, um, I suppose. But it it's really important in I think applied areas such as forensic psychology, where what we do isn't perfect, and we do the very best that we can to have I think a balance of of appreciation. Um, as well as, you know, what is important, which is, you know, valid and, and serious, uh, you know, criticism and academic rigor. And, and before I read you this, this paper, I'm, don't worry, I'm not reading you the paper, but the, 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 this paper just always reminds me of the Theodore Roosevelt uh, quote, and, and I have it in front of me, I didn't remember this verbatim, but, you know, it's not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again, because there is no effort without error and shortcoming, but who does actually strive to do the deeds, who knows great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at the worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither know victory nor defeat. Now, it's almost important to say that that, might, that quote may sum up what forensic psychology is. I mean, it is this battle of people in the arena, you know, trying their hardest, often with good intentions, exclu hopefully always exclusively with good intentions, um, trying our very best to to help uh, in, in complicated, uncertain and applied settings. And what's interesting is you do have people like Brent in this case, the, the you know, the 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 critic. And, and it's it's important to understand the balance of those. So so what I want you to do at the end of this, uh, this reading or, or this 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 audio or video, whichever way you you digest this content is I want you to just reflect on that for a moment. So just reflect on this idea of, of who's right. The critic who can stand there and say, well, this isn't perfect and this doesn't work. Or, or the person down there trying 
And then how do we handle this, this, this idea, you know, if he fails, he fails while daring greatly. Well, 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 failure while daring greatly in forensic psychology, as we'll see throughout the weeks of this course, that's, that's not an ideal situation to be in. Um, so it's a really interesting philosophical balance. Um, and so that's kind of why I brought this paper to your attention, because I think, I think it's interesting to, to see the side of the critic. So if we're to start this paper, and I'm not going to, a lot of this stuff is, is, is good information for you to read um, and, and things for you to know, but, but stuff that will be covered in the class, you know, kind of what criminal profiling is. They're obviously going to go into Douglas Resler and Burgess's work and kind of the expansion and um, kind of increase uh, prevalence of criminal criminal profiling and kind of how it's increased over time and, and, and kind of the, the the widespread use of it. And really what they're doing here is they're just painting an argument that we're using a lot of criminal profiling. We have a vague and fuzzy conceptualization of what it is. It is very widespread and increasing. And what they're going to do then is juxtapose that with the, well, hang on a minute, how is something spreading and getting more uh, prevalent in society if we don't have a decent evidence base uh, for the fact that it works. And so as we kind of come down here, we get to this delightful section, the lack of a scientific basis to criminal profiling, very, very unidirectional that. Um, and basically, so we've got two sections here. So our commonly used profiles, uh, profiling typology is actually false typologies and is CP based on an empirically supported theory. Now they're talking about basically something that we're going to cover in lectures one and two, which is this idea of kind of um, behavioral consistency and kind of homology. This idea of can we really separate crimes into different types of crime? And if we can separate crimes into different types of crime, does that realistically tell us anything about the person? Um, I mean, as, I, as I'll show you throughout the, later on in the course, you know, if you, if you can't answer those two questions, you can't realistically hold profiling to a uh, to, to a scientific um, standard because it's built on the assumption that behavior tells you something about the person. Take that one logical step further and therefore the um, different behaviors must therefore be in uh, undertaken by different people or people with different personality uh, aspects. So here what they're doing is they're going into some of the, the, the background of the, of the history behind that and some of the tests that they've done. Um, they then move into their third act, if you will. Uh, can profile, can professional profilers make accurate predictions? And I mean, I think we can all guess based on the tone of this article that they want the answer to be no. Um, but they, they talk about some really interesting studies. And one of the ones I'll, I'll probably... So I'm recording this uh, before kind of the semester has started. Um, so So... When I say I'm going to try and do something, obviously I have to factor in a virtual element of that. But one of the things I often do in my classes is I get students to do the the contents of the, I think it's the Eastwood 2007 study, where I get them to fill in these profiles. And then I, I look at their scores and I say, right, if I gave this to an expert profiler, how much more accurate do you think he would be than you are? Um, and then I show them the kind of the results here, which is you find that realistically the, the, the degree of the degree of skill separation between an expert profiler and a, and a kind of a lay uh, a lay student participant is actually not as great as you'd think. And so it questions this idea that profiling is a, uh, a markable uh, skill, uh, you know, that, that a profiler can, can you know, is, is separate or, or assesses the situation or sees things differently to a novice. You know, imagine a plumber, right, and you bring this plumber around and you show him your bath had this recently, actually, I, I flooded my own house. Um, and, you know, I looked at it and thought, right, this is what I think is going on. And then uh, the plumber came over, who happens to be my wife's father, and he said, no, that's just not how the house works. This is actually what's going on. Now, there you've got this separation of skill uh, and perception and ability based on skill, right? He sees it differently. He comes to the answer better than me, and he's correct. That's what, you know, in theory, a profiler should do it. So a lay police officer says, right, I think this, this, this and this. And then the profiler comes in riding on a cloud um, and says, oh, no, you know, you're actually wrong. It's this, this, this and this. If, 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 if the profiler makes better and more accurate judgments than the police officer, then profiling is, you know, this, this skill and it, it exists. And so this area of research kind of questions that. Um, it's actually a really hard area of research because imagine you are a criminal profiler and someone says to you i'm trying to do a study to prove that criminal profilers aren't very good are you going to take part in that study 
Now you might because you want to prove them wrong, but but you also might tell them to go f themselves. Um, which I, I think you know that's kind of some of the hostility that exists when people are kind of challenging your area of expertise. So they usually struggle in terms of recruitment and, and really getting a, a valid end. But but it's an interesting area and it's kind of it, it's good research to to be aware of. So we then get to this idea of so they move into this section called the message and and what they're doing here is they're basically talking about well so in the in the, in the early elements of this article we've laid out why we don't think criminal profiling works um, so how is it then that it's, that it's still being used and how is it then that it um, it continues to flourish the way that it does and what they basically kind of go into is this idea that. The fallacies of the human mind and the way in which the human brain kind of strings our evidence together falls naturally into a into a habit or a pattern that allows kind of the assumption that criminal profiling works to kind of spread around. So they talk about here the power of n equals one, right? And basically what they're just saying is, you know, people have a a bias towards kind of over over emphasizing the importance of a of a a single instance right so imagine you it's probably going to be a terrible analogy but imagine you are are driving to work one day right you 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 you're doing this this new route to work new job um and and google maps offers you uh, two different routes right and you go down the left route this time and, and you hit a big traffic jam and you hit every red light and it's just a real pain um, and the next day you decide to go right and you hit all of the green lights and you're like, oh, fantastic. What they're saying here is that you will kind of develop a theory. Oh, well, the, the route on the right is best because that time it worked perfectly. And the route on the left is terrible because that time it didn't work at all. And you see people get really ingrained in these um, in these in these kind of laws now almost based on on one single instance so you know the real way to test that is to do each one a hundred times average out the distances all time and then see if there's any difference and if it is which one works but we don't have time to do that it, 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 it's Kahneman and Tversky's work right we're, we're cognitive misers so sometimes you know one thing happens and we create a rule out of it you know and that's kind of you know how so what they're saying here is that basically very few people you know they have one instance with a profiler and then from that they declare that the profiler works um which, which then comes into the second point about repetition which is the idea you know we we say profiling works because everybody tells us profiling works so we just therefore kind of assume it is um and then it's a few more of these kind of through the next sections the myth of expertise and and, and and an inappropriate reliance on correct predictions but what basically they're just saying is that people aren't systematically testing whether profiles are accurate or not. However, when one is accurate, people overestimate that they're all accurate. And then the the myth idea is the idea that someone walks in and tells you, hi, I'm an expert in human behavior and I can pick out a criminal from a mile away. Oh, fantastic. The fact that they've come in and said that to you makes you believe that they can do it because they've told you that they're an expert and they can. It, it's, it's a human fallacy. But basically, this idea is that we we trust people when they tell us things. And so if someone tells you they can do something, we we kind of believe that um, that kind of aspect. So it, it's a really interesting section because it kind of shows that the the spread of profiling just fits with the human mind, really, in the way that we we don't really absorb all of the evidence. You know, we have these myths in our mind about what can be done, and I talk about that in the in the origins of profiling lecture. Um, I talk about what can be done, uh, and, and people believe that it, that it can be done, and then you know they hear a story about it working, or they have an instance in which it works, and it's the power of that positive messaging which overrides the many, many times that a profiler may be wrong or that they didn't really help or that they weren't really much use. So it's kind of a, a memory error kind of tied in with the kind of... Um, uh, kind of tied in with the with the issue of... of um, of, of kind of you know using the profiles now this is this is really interesting kind of the finding meaning in ambiguous information section of the article and what that is and we are actually going to come to this in week two we do a lecture on Toulmin's philosophy of argument um, it's a really important lecture actually it, it's one of the important ones to think about but what they're talking about here is basically that work you know they're citing Allison 
Uh, and I think in there they're probably citing Louise's work as well. Uh, no, her work was 2011. I think this article was a bit before then. Um, but basically what, what Lawrence did is he kind of analysed a bunch of criminal profiles and their contents and he measured the kind of accuracy of the language. You know, think about this. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to describe to you the car that I have. Um, you know, one of those ways of describing the car that I have is very accurate and you can tell if I'm wrong. So it would be, uh, it's a uh, four, it's four-wheel drive. I'm, I'm trying to think of what my car has. Uh, it's four-wheel drive, it's blue. Um, it's made by a, uh, a well-known manufacturer and you've probably seen about 17 on the road last time you drove, right? Okay, that's, a, that's an accurate description. The other is, it would be kind of, you know, my car is a vehicle um, that kind of commutes me from A to B on the roads. Uh, it, it has more than one wheel, um, you know, a, a plural of wheels, if you will. It has a plurality of doors, multiple doors, um, many makes uh, of car. It is one of the makes of car, and you, you likely have seen one of the cars of this make, potentially of this color at the same time, uh, at one point in your life. Now, th that is a is a is a ambiguous phrase about what my car is, right? And you're probably in a slightly harder position to try and guess what my car might be. Or at least there's a lot more options. Now, but what's interesting is if I told you that my car was a, a blue RAV4, um, it matches the first one and the second one, right? Technically, both are accurate. If I told you my car was a white Mercedes-Benz, it doesn't match the first one, the accurate one, and it, it, it does match it does match the second one, which is ambiguous. So what they're talking about here is this idea that if you write a profile ambiguously enough, it can match a lot of potential outcomes and therefore it's always right. So that's kind of what he's talking about in terms of meaning, finding meaning in ambiguous information. So it's this idea that, they, that the early profiles can sometimes be written in ways that kind of can't be wrong. And it's something that we call a, um, uh, a Barnum effect. And we'll, we'll get into that together in class. Um, and so, so, so finally, we kind of get to the get to the conclusions. These are supposed to be five minute videos. I realise I'm now on seventeen. Uh, I make I make no promises they're going to get any shorter. To be honest, uh, turns out I really like doing this. Um, but basically, in the conclusions, he he basically is juxtaposing these these two realities together. Right, one reality is the widespread use of criminal profiling. The other is that underneath all of it, there are serious questions about the existence of the field. You know, like this is a an interesting concept with forensic psychology but we're still arguing if it can even be done uh, let alone how it should be done and when it should be done but but he really is advocating this idea of you know is it even a field of study is it even a a, a realm of possibility and he talks about the assumptions in there he talks about the um the lack of evidence we talked about the content but what's so interesting is that it it, it fits or it's found its way because of so many different kind of uh, ways of the human mind and the way that we remember things and the way that we think about things and kind of the myths that we're told. And so you get these kind of parallel realities almost, one in which criminal profiling is the solution to all of our problems and one in which is, you know, criminal profiling is a is a faux is a faux field that doesn't exist and can't realistically achieve what it says it's going to achieve. Now I'm not here to tell you what the answer is. You know, if you take criminal profiling at this university or you look at any of the, the videos, and I'll, I'll place them in this course, I'm sure, there are criminal profilers who have worked in the field and who are convinced that their psychological insights aid in the investigative process. And then there are those, Snook being kind of one of the, one of the leaders of the movement, that re really don't think it, it, it's real. Um, now, I personally would say I'm kind of a mid-ground a mid here, and one of the things I'm going to talk to you about next week is you can there is a version of profiling that looks very much like the version of profiling that snook here is arguing against after this article was written a couple years later we actually find that the 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 realm of profiling has kind of upped its game a little bit and kind of changed the way it's changed the way it, it operates and does its work and that actually moves towards a, a far more scientifically driven and defensible mode of science um so again i just i i hope you enjoyed uh this i hope you enjoyed this reading i think it's i think it's interesting um and i really i really hope you just take a moment to think about that kind of philosophical question about um a kind of you know how we 
balance you know the the need for for scientific verification and the need to be in the arena you know we we aren't in here psychologists aren't there kind of willy-nilly you know just trying to throw advice at people they're they're there because they are needed and because in theory we you know we we we, we have a role to play um the question is is the balance of that and, it, and there's a, a spectrum of opinions and so i, I hope this kind of gave you insights into into one side and I'll, I'll do my best to portray the others in our in our lectures going forward so thank you for week one i hope you enjoy the reading i'll see you next week